<laughs> Hi, everybody. It's so great to see everyone here. I am Rogelio, as Nathan said, I'm here on behalf of my co-authors to present our paper on game system models. And uh, I want to say that this work is sponsored in part by the National Science Foundation through my career award. And I'm, it's the first time I'm able to say that. So yay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions about how this work relates to the career award, uh, take that offline. Happy to answer it. All right, so let's talk about this paper. Whoop. I wanna begin with a somewhat personal story. Um, this requires we go back in time to when I was young, naive and full of hope, uh, my grad school days. Uh, that's grad school Rogelio, if, in case you were wondering. And in specific, going all the way back to FDG 2011, which was celebrated in Bordeaux, in France. That fun fact was my first games conference. And it was also the first time that I had heard of Ludogor by Adam Smith, Mark Nelson, and Michael Mateus, which was actually published the year before. Now, if you're not familiar with what Ludogor is, so Ludogor is uh, uh, basically like a mechanics kind of game engine. You can encode mechanics in a temporal event calculus and prove things about your mechanics as part of use in the system. Uh, that is actually taken from the paper itself, uh, showing a block diagram of the different components. So I kid you not, when I first saw this, uh, this was my reaction. Oh my gosh, I have to build this. This was so cool. Again, my first games conference, I had no idea what I was doing. And I was really excited about this potential idea. Uh, unfortunately, this story doesn't really have a happy ending. I honestly couldn't figure it out. Um, to no fault of the authors. There's only so much you can put into a paper, as we likely know. Uh, there are several implementation details and latent assumptions about how Ludocore was built. And in particular, I really couldn't separate what was assumed to be under the domain of responsibility for the Ludocore engine and what was assumed to be part of the game engine that ran Ludocore. And this was just a, a constant pain and I really just couldn't figure out in time. So to make a long story short, this paper that I'm talking about today is for grad school Rogelio. It's in essence, it's the paper that I needed at the time to be able to actually make sense of things. And so surprisingly in, in a good way, this paper is almost primarily theoretical and it's really just to make sense of the vast amount of work that we have in our community. The point of the paper and the thing that I want you hopefully to walk away with is this. We need to clarify game system models. And beyond making that point in the paper, the paper also goes and shows one way in which we can do it. And so now we can. You don't have to follow my methodology for it, but it is possible to do this. And the rest of the talk will detail, number one, why bother beyond helping poor grad school Rogelio. Uh, why bother with this? Like, why is this really a problem? Second, what is it that I am arguing needs clarification? And third, very, very briefly conceptually allude to how to go about clarifying because I do not have time to go into the math of it. Um, I promise you there is exactly one heavy math slide. Let's start. Why is it that we need to clarify game system models? And let's assume for the sake of argument for now, we're just going to focus on those game system models for procedural content generation, which I think we broadly understand as a community what it's about. In looking at, for example, let's talk about generating Pac-Man levels. We have this idea of a level that we want to generate, its overall function, its form. If you wanted to use a model-based approach to generating Pac-Man levels, then you roughly have one of two choices available. Um, you can either rely on a language or rely on a framework. And now these are buzzwords at this point. So let me just clarify what I mean by these. If you're in the use of languages, then you're broadly speaking about using something that provides a set of elements. Now you don't have necessarily a choice of what elements you can play with, but the elements are provided to you as like the level of abstraction of the corresponding language. Contrasted with something like frameworks, which takes actually elements and breaks them down into more atomic constituent properties, and then you can play with the properties themselves. So you can have something like the cherry item and talk about its potential to be consumed as an item or its potential to award points to the player and actually play with those, those properties. Uh, to kind of give another conceptual take on this, whereas languages, it's like you have a, a set of Legos that you can play with, 
and you can't change the Legos I give you. In frameworks, it's as if you had a 3D printer of Legos. And so you can print your own Legos if you don't like the ones I give you. And as long as they can fit into other parts, you're okay. Now we have examples of this out in the wild and just to cherry pick two examples. So an example of a language would be something like the VGDL or the video game description language. An example of a framework, which is far more general and powerful is Scepter by Chris Martin. So the Scepter framework allows you to talk about properties that can change in stages and rule applications. Okay, so the question of when to use one or the other really is contextual. The broad principle is if the game that you care to reason about relies on elements in the case of languages or properties in the case of frameworks that the model gives you, then conceptually it's easy to express that corresponding game in the language or in the framework. And concordantly, it's easy to support it for analysis or design or generation. Critical in this is that each one provides different abstractions. So each language or framework will provide different elements or different properties to play with that are relevant to the kinds of games they care about. But there is a problem. And this is probably the most incendiary slide of this talk. Current game system models do not justify abstractions in games theoretic terms. Now, this sounds like an incendiary statement. It also has a lot of content. So what do I mean by this? So what does this mean as a claim? For that, we have to talk about what abstraction is in the first place. So back in 2020, wow, so long ago, in 2020, I wrote an aid paper to try to pin down this notion of abstraction in mathematical language. And broadly speaking, abstraction is this process of you describing something in terms of a quote unquote, more fundamental something else. And I put that in scare quotes because what determines whether something is more fundamental or not really depends on who's doing the abstraction and for what purpose. But an example of this is when you go off and design a Pathfinder algorithm. So in this example scenario, this is taken from the earlier paper, say that you have this virtual world and I call it a CVW for my concrete virtual world in which I have a character and I want to move them to some target location using a pathfinding algorithm. Now you can think of this pathfinding task as in essence, a mathematical function that transforms your current position to the target position over some time, right? Now, we rarely perform pathfinding directly in this concrete virtual world because it's not necessarily efficiently computable. And so what usually happens is that we take this and we abstract it over into what I'm calling the abstract virtual world in which the computation is just easier for us to perform in terms of space consumed, time consumed, memory, and so on. Now, this process going from the concrete to the abstract is a lifting process. We are like raising the level of abstraction. We lift the world into a more abstract representation and we can represent the world itself in terms of its geometry, including things like obstacles that I cannot traverse. Also my starting position and my end position. In this lower dimensional space, I can perform my pathfinding more efficiently and find what is in essence a proxy for what I want, which is in this case, a path in the tile graph space. We're not done, of course, because we don't need the solution in that world. We need the solution back in the concrete world. And so we have to basically take this solution, which is our proxy and perform a grounding step. So we ground the solution in the app from the abstract world into the concrete world where we make it manifest. The paper, the 2020 paper, just is about defining all these terms and collectively, I call all of them an abstraction scheme. It's basically a strategy with which you go from concrete to abstract, do computation, and then go back from abstract to concrete. Fun fact, there's typically a loss of information. So the solution isn't always, it isn't guaranteed to be perfect and you have to deal with those edge cases when you bring it back to the, ground, the, the, the grounded concrete virtual world. Now in this talk previously, I mentioned this idea of two kinds of model-based approaches. And so the insight that I hope the paper is providing to y'all is that in the same way that we have this concrete abstract notion, it basically applies to game system models where 
the game systems that we have are the things that we're carrying to reason in our languages and or frameworks. And the abstract version of that is all, is like lives in this more like lower dimensional space, right? The, the, the key is that all these variables that are part of this process are usually left implicit when we write papers about these systems. And so that's what I mean by saying like current game system models do not justify the abstractions in games theoretic terms, in terms of like the things that they are looking at to abstract or properties of the things that I'm looking to abstract. So generally we have the following unanswered questions and I'll give you like the technical definition of the question and also what that means conceptually. So question number one, that's usually left unanswered. What are we abstracting? What concrete virtual world do we care about? Said differently, what kinds of games are we talking about in the class of systems that we're dealing with? Second, why are we using these elements or properties in our abstract virtual world? Said differently, in essence, what do we think that these games are fundamentally made from and why is it that we think that? And third, how are the abstractions in this abstract virtual space made concrete by game elements in our concrete virtual world? In other words, how is it that these fundamental aspects that we think are intrinsic to the class of games we care about, how are they made manifest in actual game code? These questions are often left unanswered due to various pragmatic reasons. And to be clear, I do not mean to critique game models uh, on, on the basis of not answering this stuff. So that, like, I want to put it explicitly that the fact that these questions are unanswered doesn't make them bad or, or inadequate at all. In fact, I see system building as a fundamental part of our science. They start conversations. So what I'm asking in this paper, in long form in this paper, is can we continue the conversation by continuing to answer these questions? And I will say, this is another incendiary statement, continuing to ignore these kinds of abstractions that underlie our game system models is akin to building sandcastles atop water because we don't know what ground we're, we're, we're dealing with. And, and I don't know about y'all, personally, I feel like our community right now is basically doing things siloed, alone, but coming together to talk about them. I would love for that not to be the case anymore. I'd love to start comparing answers to our research questions and our paper tries to chart a path toward that. So we need to clarify game system models. And I spent the most amount of the presentation time just on the point of why uh, for the sake of clarity, comparison and community, because legit, if I convinced you of that, then you'll read the paper by yourself. Um, but I do wanna speak a little bit more about what is it that I'm saying we need to clarify. So on to the second point. I've already given you the answer kind of upfront. I've said, you know, we need to clarify all these elements. Um, in essence, this is to clarify what is our chosen game system class. So we might use a specific exemplar in our papers but is it that we want to target games of that type or just that one exemplar? And that, that matters for our abstraction. Um, and of course, grad school Rogelio has something to say about that. Um, what about games running on a platform like a game engine? Don't we need to track that too? Yep. Full stop. Yeah, that's part of the problem. It's that it's really tedious and it's super complex. Game systems are themselves abstractions. And so it's turtles all the way down. That's okay though, we can inspect them. So one benefit that we have because these are artificially constructed environments, we can inspect them. And I'm, of course, I'm speaking specifically about the case of digital experiences. For analog, I'd love to have that discussion. So in addition to clarifying our chosen game system class, we also have to note, yeah, this depends on some kind of underlying engine model. And we also need to clarify, what is that model look like? Okay, so that was the what? See the attached note to clarify. We're gonna keep that note around for a little while. Um, how can we do this? And I have exactly one minute left. <laughs> how can we do this? So let's keep that note. So general strategy points. Number one, to identify our chosen game system class, I'm arguing we absolutely need to take seriously our game studies colleagues who focus predominantly on the qualitative aspects of the games that we wanna work with. 
So let's seriously engage them in conversation to understand what are the things that define the game constituents that we're modeling. The general strategy for number two is mathematically defined game engines. And I'll get to that very, 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 very briefly. About 30 seconds left, here we go. As to the game studies engagement, recently, our third, uh, the, the third author of this paper in, in their dissertation published the so-called unifying game ontology. His words, not mine. But I will say that this might serve as a good community model for game systems across a large class. This was constructed through an inductive structural analysis of games that have been published and are out there. And in essence, whoop, there we go. In essence, it is a faceted classification. So it's kind of like a library indexing system of games based on these categories, mechanics, goals, randomness, entities, space, and time. Broadly speaking, the game ontology argues games represent facets of these and the ontology contains example types with references to specific games. Um, there are also three properties that are not shown here. Um, oh, there we go. So again, I'm arguing that this could be a common conceptual model for us. Wow, I can't believe that this is animating so weirdly. Um, and in the paper, we define this game interaction model that supports the ontology. In essence, we consider game systems in the ecosystem of players and interfaces, and our game system allows you to express aspects, like a lot of aspects, of, several aspects of the game ontology. The full coverage, I have not proven that I can do it, but in the paper, I argue why we cover a significant set. Um, this explicitly links to game engines by way of the game world, which is the basis for representing mechanics and dynamics. And the game engine is considered to be a constituent part of the model. And of course, grad school Rahelio strikes again. But wait a minute, aren't game engines abstractions too? Ugh. Yes, that's also part of the problem. Uh, game engines are also themselves abstractions, but that's okay because we can also inspect them. But that, that's it, that, that, no more. They are the most concrete virtual world that we reason about in our paper. And in essence, we support a game engine model definition. So we define game engines as being composed of three components, the geometric world, the physical world, and the time scale, because only these are needed to represent the game ontology. And in essence, there's an argument in the paper that says, you know what, at its core, you could probably reduce it just, just the time scale because all you need is a simulation component. And this is the math to help you reason over all that stuff in a unified manner. It's called the modal mu calculus. It allows you to reason over states and transitions and properties of states and transitions. No way I'm gonna discuss this now. That's it. The call to action to everyone, let's define community models and let's stop building these sandcastles atop water. Thanks everyone.